We're going to look into desalination technology, the technology that removes salt from ocean water, making it drinkable. There is a lot of ocean water. There's also a lot of people without clean water. Let's see if technology can solve this problem. Let's start with some UN water scarcity statistics. Currently, 1% of the world's population is completely dependent on desalinated water. Now, the UN also expects that 14% of the world's population will experience water scarcity by 2025. And one third of the world is experiencing what they call water stress, meaning that you have to make some decisions on where to allocate it to maximize what you have. And desalinated seawater presents a great opportunity to get ahead of this problem before it gets out of hand. So why isn't every government that has access to seawater building desalinated desalination plants? Well, in a nutshell, it's cost. So although there's a lot of emerging technologies, the two main ways that you usually clean seawater is with thermal distillation and reverse osmosis. So thermal distillation involves heating the water until it produces steam, which then rises up, separates out from the other elements, and then is condensed back down into drinkable water. And it's a great way to separate the salt out behind, but it requires a ton of energy. It's just very expensive from an energy point of view. And realistically, it's cost prohibitive when it comes to millions of people and the amount of water that we need for our showers and our food and our manufacturing. It's just simply too expensive. Now, the method that all the major desalination plants use is called reverse osmosis. And this is the process of forcing water through a membrane with very small pores. And these are like really tiny pores. They're just small enough for the water molecule to slip through, but they're too tight for the salt molecule to get through. While this method is effective at removing a wide range of contaminants, it's also imperfect, complicated, maintenance heavy, and very energy intensive, not to mention also pretty costly. At ChatGPT translation, there's really no deep pockets that are willing to to fund a bunch of lobbyists to go fight against Coke and Pepsi. Those companies make buckets of money trucking around water bottles full of tap water and selling them to us. But like so many things, AI to the rescue. It is definitely giving a bright glimmer of hope to this problem. So in this video, I wanna cover the three ways that AI is lowering the cost of building a desalination plant for a city. But first, I wanna introduce you to our sponsor. Hi, I'm Dylan, I'm the sponsor. Because we only have 866 subscribers still. It's okay, I feel like we're growing. I know this takes a lot of work, but if you wanna do me a solid right there, I would love it if you would hit the subscribe button, maybe even the bell icon or a comment if you really feel like it. Okay, now back to the video. Today, we are headed out to the Salt Flats to learn about desalination. We've got my friend Guillermo here. Now that we're all clean, let's uh, navigate to the Bonifil salt flats. Now the first way that artificial intelligence is starting to even the field is by applying deep neural nets to material science. In one sense, we're really lucky that the water molecules are just so incredibly tiny and they're the ones that we wanna separate out. Because of that, if we can find the perfect membrane that only allows just the water to get through and it can grab every other type of element that might be in the water, then we have the ultimate screening material. So as a macro scale metaphor, imagine when you drop like a bag of green tea into your hot water, all of a sudden the caffeine and the, uh, the green, whatever the green is, chloroplasts or something, or just the green from the leaf, they soak through the little pores, but then you pull the leaves out and you have just what's left, green tea, water, and whatever that green stuff is. However, with the desalination plant, the geometry of the filter is different. The geometry of these nanopores, nano meaning extremely small, very tiny pores, has to be more like a sponge. There has to be thousands of different layers. And at each level, there's different shapes that you're allowing through. This allows you to filter out different types of debris and sediment and only let the one molecule that you want from water to like work its way through each of the pores. And it's constantly picking up the other types of materials at different layers. And when I'm saying nano, we're talking about atom size. You sometimes want a single atom size pour for the water to go through. Because the H2O's kind of got that little shape and it can just like bloop, work its way through a tiny little pour like that and everything else gets stuck. Building a material that is this perfect and this small and knowing what to build in the first place has been something that has been beyond the reach of scientists until artificial intelligence showed up Hello. on the scene recently. And we're getting closer to figuring out the perfect geometry. Amir Faramani and his colleagues used a deep learning convolutional neural network 
and AI agents to decide which atoms should be sequentially removed from a graphene membrane. And fascinating side note, once they removed all the atoms, the final product that had the most efficient geometry was actually fractal in nature. And this is a great breakthrough for purifying water, but it also opens the door to using a similar technique to create different shapes to pull out some of the more important elements that we might want to use for other purposes, like batteries and nuclear power. There's a full 80,000 cubic miles of water that's evaporated out of the ocean. And at that point, of course, the water is being purified, the salt is being left in the ocean, and that pure water without salt is then dropped on top of mountain ranges and places like that, forming streams. Those streams are eroding the rocks and they're pulling minerals out, mostly salt, into that water. And a full four billion tons of salt actually gets pulled out of rocks and dumped into the ocean every year. And then even more surprisingly that I didn't even really think about is that inside the earth there's like molten rock moving around. It's liquid, it's moving, and it's pulling the bottom of the ocean floors with it and it pulls that salt back down into the earth. Now the second way it's used is helping in maintenance costs. By automating all of the moving parts in a big desalination plant, algorithms can now step in to make decisions. And these algorithms can often optimize the output of clean water, while also reducing and minimizing the output of brine, which is the waste, the very salty waste that has to go back into the ocean. Neural networks are great at taking into account many variables. For example, AI can be used to control the flow of water and adjust the pressure and temperature in real time to maximize the amount of purified water produced. And in real time, it can react to other variables like weather and demand. So AI can be used to see all sorts of maintenance problems and make predictions about what might break before it does. And this will reduce the downtime and increase the overall reliability of the entire desalination plant. And God knows mistakes like that happen. Remember that sewage thing that happened? I accidentally dumped whatever, like a billion gallons of sewage into London's river. This stuff can happen. It'd be good if we had AI paying attention all the time, thinking about these kind of variables to help us out. So a couple other fun facts. It only takes about 4,000 years for all of the water in the ocean to completely evaporate. So the water now is more salty than it was when the dinosaurs were around. And salty water tends to evaporate slower. So if you go swimming in the ocean for some, or this the Great Salt Lake where we are here, where it's like super salty, and you have salt water on your skin and you air dry, it will take a lot longer than if you have fresh water. So what's left after you remove the water is the salt, the brine. And when you dump that back into the oceans, it wreaks havoc on the ecosystems. But if you return the salt to the ocean far enough apart and in small enough quantities, nature can adapt. If we make desalination plants with lots of ways to get rid of the brine and you have an artificial intelligence system taking variables from all of the different outlets and helping decide where the brine should go at what time based on what it knows about the environment that it's going to be let into, it can do a much better job keeping the ecosystem healthy. Also in the future, I don't think we will be dumping as much brine just back into the ocean because in that brine there's some important elements. There's trace amounts of thorium and uranium which can actually be used to power nuclear power plants. And there's also a lot of materials that we use for batteries, for electric cars and electric devices like cobalt, nickel, and lithium. Imagine if we get the right kind of nanopore structure that can pull that out and save it. All of a sudden, it's like mining. Maybe it will really be something that pays itself off because of the awesome materials that also can come out of cleaning the water. And that's the kind of win-win situation that I'm hoping AI can bring us to at the end of the day. All right, so we are here. It's a... Uh kind of intense place. I mean, it makes you feel like you're kind of on another planet. And it almost is. This whole thing is almost 50 miles, uh, square miles. It has almost five feet of this super kind of crusty salt in the center. And we're kind of on the edge here. It's probably about a foot or so. But, um, you know, this is the bottom of what was the once Lake Bonneville, a lake that was almost two thirds the size of the entire state of Utah. And as it evaporated, it left all of this mineral. Welcome, welcome to the salt flats. So here's a question. Do you think in the future that we're gonna end up using more water or less water? Because surprisingly, there was some pretty good arguments for why we might actually use less water in the future. Like right now we use a lot more water to make a water bottle than it actually holds in water. So maybe in the future we get better at manufacturing and we don't use that much. We get better at farming and we don't need to use so much. So. That would be one reason why maybe desalination plants don't grow um, 
at kind of the pace I'm imagining. But so far, if you just look historically, water use has been growing at more than twice the rate of the population increase in the last century. And an increasing number of regions are reaching their limit at which water services can be sustainably delivered. As populations become more industrialized and more advanced, they do tend to just suck up more water. So I'm gonna assume that trend will continue. And my final thought is just, if you think about it from like a military perspective, it's vital that your citizens have clean water because if you end up going to war and they cut off your water supply, or you know, being more optimistic, if you have extra water and you have the kind of desalination technology and you can have an abundant amount of clean water, you can use it as a peace offering and you can give it to your neighbors or your allies or whatever. So that's about it. There's just a lot of political reasons why I think desalination plants are going to continue to grow. If you like this content or you have some thoughts throw them in the comments below you know click around stay on the channel see what youtube's recommending to you in this video right here